passion of our Savior. The passion of our Savior. The mercy of our God. The cross leaves no question of the measure of His love. Can we see this together? Our chains are gone. Our chains are gone. Our dead is paid. The cross has overthrown the grave. For Jesus' blood that sets us free means death to death. Guilty while the guilty one walks free. Death would be his portion and our portion liberty. Come on, see this with me. Our chains are gone. Our chains are gone. The cross has overthrown the grave for Jesus' blood that sets us free, be set to death and life for me. I give, I give my whole life to honor. This love by the Lamb who was slain, I'm forgiven. The sinner Savior, crown him forever. For the Lamb who was slain, He is. Come on, see that again. I give, I give my whole life to water. Father, we thank you and we bless you for all you've done for us. We thank you for Jesus who gave his life, who rose from the dead, who ascended to the right hand of the Father, who's now interceding for us, who is sending and baptizing us in the Holy Spirit, who's still working and healing and restoring and making whole, who's still giving peace and joy and life. Father, be exalted in this place. Be exalted in this place, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, welcome to LifeGate Church today. It's a real joy to have you here. We pray that this time of worship has been an incredible blessing to you and that God has moved already and God has spoken. You know, there's so many things going on in the life of our church at the moment. There's a number of people not well and people that are struggling. We want to take some time to pray. 
We're going to pray particularly for Karen, Pretorius, who needs healing. Um, we want to pray for Leslie, who needs healing. We want to pray for Carl, who needs healing. We want to pray. So will you bow your heads and pray with me? And let's call on the God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. One of His names is Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals. So God, we, we are turned to You today, and we cry out to You in the name of Jesus. You are the God who heals. Jesus, You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we now pray for Karen, and we pray Your healing upon Karen, that every tumour will be um, destroyed in Jesus' name, and the cancer would leave her body in Jesus' name. We pray for Carl. We pray, Lord, Your hand will be upon him and the healing that he needs in Jesus' name. Upon Leslie and Andreas and what they need in Jesus' name. And any other person in this room or watching online who needs a move of God, we pray for you now in the name of Jesus. We pray that Jesus would heal you. We speak life over you. We speak life and health and prosperity and blessing in the mighty name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. I'd encourage you now just to bring your own prayers to the Lord. The stuff that's on your heart, your needs, your concern, bring them to the Lord. Take some time and pray now. worship you, God, for all you are and all you've done. I invite you to pray for those that don't, who you, those in your life, your friends, your family who don't know Jesus yet. Pray that God will reveal Himself to them. Open hearts and minds to the message of the gospel. Merciful God, merciful God, righteous God, the God who justifies and redeems and makes whole and sets the captives free and gives life in abundance. That is the God we worship today. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise Him, eh? to be in His presence, to experience His peace and love and joy, to be able to pray to Him. What a privilege to pray to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Jesus Christ. In love, He adopted us to be holy and blameless in His sight. He has forgiven us and given us hope and life and joy. And we stand or we sit here, whatever you're doing today, knowing that God loves you and that He's for you. He's fighting for you. He's working on your, on your behalf. He's bringing all things together for the good of those who love Him and have been called according to His purpose. He's working for you. He's fighting for you. Receive that in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We'll grab a seat. Grab a seat if you're, if you're still standing, and we want to welcome those online. Thanks for being part of this today. Oh, well, friends, this morning at 9 o'clock, if you get our emails, you would have received an email from us from our annual survey each year. We ask our church to fill in a survey. It takes about 10 minutes. It's anonymous. It landed in your inbox today. If you get our emails, you would have got it. If you don't get our emails, go to the Start Here desk. And let us know. We, we, you don't get our emails. We, we will take your email address and we'll get that sent to you. Please fill it in by the end of the month. It gives us great information about where you're at and helps to set direction for the church moving forward. All right. Good morning, church. Are we on? Good morning. Good morning. Everyone come take your seat. If you don't know me, my name is Sarah. And it's an honor to be up here to bring you the sermon this morning. 
But I thought I might start with a good news story first. Is that okay? So if you know some of my family's story, you probably know about my son, Nathaniel. If you don't know about my family's story, I have a son named Nathaniel who's 10, almost 11, and he has a very rare syndrome called Apert syndrome. And this year, he had the biggest surgery of his life. It was his 10th surgery. And I want to just let you know what's happened. So in February, he went in and he had um, a facial reconstructive surgery, basically. He had a device put on his face that has moved his facial bones forward. So the device went on in February, and then we turned it every day. Oh, poor kid. Um, every day we turned it, so the bones very slowly were brought forward. And then this device stayed on his face for three months, and it came off in May. So I want to show you. Is this working? Here he is. So this is my little man before surgery with the device on his face. And there's a photo of him the other day. Terrible hairstyle. <laughs> and I just want to let you know that not only has this surgery improved Nathaniel's physical appearance by moving his bones forward, but it's improved his speech. And the doctors told us that his speech would become worse with this surgery. But his speech is clearer, which has improved his confidence. So he is engaging in conversation more socially. So he's socially more confident. His breathing has been improved, and probably like everybody else, we've you know, had multiple colds this winter. There's so many viruses going around. And so he's had a cold that knocked me for six for four days, and one day he had a cold, he was fine the next day, which doesn't happen with him. He could just clear everything he needed to clear. And the thing that's been the most amazing is it's improved his cognition. Like, he's smarter. His memory is better. He, this teacher's like, what's happened? And I spoke to the surgeon last week, and I said, um, Nathaniel's like smarter. And the surgeon said, I've had this report from a few other families who've been through the same surgery. And so, thank you if you prayed for my son. <laughs> thank you for anyone who provided us a meal through this season. Thank you. And I just want to say, if you've heard me preach about my situation with Nathaniel in the past, you know, I would have told you that when I had Nady, um, I had three people give me the same scripture. And that scripture was from Joel 2.25, the years that the locust worm have stolen, I will restore to you. And our Father in heaven has been playing out that word in Nathaniel's life through this surgery. He's restored his physical appearance, his breathing, his speech, his intellect, and I am so grateful to our God that when he says something, it might have been 10 years later, but he has come to be. So praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Okay. I now haven't got a clicker to click to the next slide. <laughs> All right. Why don't we pray, yeah, before we launch into the sermon? Okay. Heavenly Father, we just want to give this time over to you. Father, would you speak through me this morning, whatever it is that each individual person in this room needs to hear from you today. Father, I pray, Lord God, they'll have ears to hear and hearts that are open to receive from you. Lord, I pray that none of us walk out of this place the same. I ask that you change us through your word today because your word is mighty and powerful. And I thank you, Lord God, for what you're going to do in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, so we are following on in our topic of discipleship today and in, with the overarching theme of multiplication. And discipleship has been the Lord's plan to see Christianity multiply across the face of this planet, and it has worked. <laughs> you know, Jesus, when he was here on earth, he had 12 disciples, and he told those 12 disciples, you go and make disciples, which they did. And then those disciples went and made disciples, who went and made disciples, who went and made disciples, and so on and so on. And here we are a couple of thousand years later, and Christianity is across the whole face of this planet. And like, it has worked. This plan has worked. And so when you read like the definition of disciple, just in the dictionary, it says, you know, somebody who follows someone's teaching. But if you look at sort of what a disciple was back in the days of Jesus, it was a bit more to it than just following somebody. And so I'm actually, yeah, I get the clicker. Yes. <laughs> so, thank you. So, I can't take credit for this research because when I 
gave this sermon at Preston's, I followed from Alex Lee, the campus pastor at Preston's, and he had given us a message on discipleship the week before myself, and he gave a really good description of what a Jewish rabbi disciple would have been like back in the days when Jesus walked to the face of the planet. And so I've copied his points. He gave me permission. Um, Just to give you a little recap of what he said. So a Jewish disciple with a rabbi would have been chosen by the rabbi, and we are chosen by the Lord God. They would have had to be totally committed. They would have had to learn scripture. They would have had to become like the rabbi and change their, the way they live their life to become like the rabbi. And then they would have been expected then to go and teach others. And this is really true for what the Lord calls us as disciples of himself. We are chosen. We are to be totally committed to him. We are to know the scriptures and learn the scriptures. We are to become like Jesus in who we are and how we act and how we live our life and what we think. And then we are to be disciple-making disciples. So I'm going to hone in on one of these points from Alex's sermon, and that point is totally committed. That's what we're going to focus on today. Okay. So I have been a Christian for a pretty long time. In fact, I was born into church, and I have you know, had enough time to see that not everybody stays the course of being a Christian. You know, life is hard. Stuff happens. And I've seen a lot of people fall away. And in fact, when Jesus gave parables, he talked about one that was the seed and the sower, where he scattered, talked about the sower scattering the seed, and it fell on four different types of soil. And only one type was the one where the seed grew up into a plant and actually multiplied and produced a harvest. So there were other types of soil, and it wasn't instantaneous. You know, it was, they took time, but over time, you know, they fell away. And the church I grew up in was a beautiful church. I grew up in a quite small church of about, say, 100, 150 people. And um, when I was 20 years old, I was one of the youth pastors. I was on staff at church. And um, I was leading the youth ministry with another guy um, who I'd grown up with and had lots of friends at church that I had been friends with since we were little kids. And a bit like I've got kids now here and I'm expecting them to be friends with the kids they're growing up with when they're adults, and I had that same experience. And so 20 years old, I was coming um, home from uni, and I just felt like, I'm just going to go to church and spend some time praying. So I went to the church building. There was nobody there. I had a key, so I let myself in, and I was in the church room, and it was fairly late in the afternoon, so the room was quite dark, and I was praying for the youth ministry and praying for the church. And because it was late in the afternoon, the sun hit the back window of the church, And the room that was dark suddenly flooded with light. And I just felt the Holy Spirit say to me, the areas that are dark, I'm going to shine my light. And within two weeks, all of this secret sin in the leadership of the church all came out into the light. And I'm not going to go through everything that came out because it was a lot. But it was some pretty dark things. Um, Like our worship pastor, who was a married woman, she was my friend. She was having a lesbian affair with one of the youth girls I was discipling in the youth ministry. Like, I'm talking big stuff. And the church fell apart. And a lot of the families left the church. The church continued on for about a year after all of that sort of imploded. Um, And I know, like, I've, I've looked... And it's not for me to judge all those people I grew up with in church to say what they do or do not have a relationship with the Lord. That is not my place. But they don't go to church anymore. And if you look at their life, it doesn't look like they're following Jesus. So I know that not everybody stays the course and not everybody stays totally committed to him. But I know that his heart is that we would stay totally committed to him and remain the course you know, all the way through until we see him face to face. Amen? That's his desire for us. And when he talks about being a disciple, when he spoke about that, he did not sugarcoat it. In fact, he told us to count the cost. And I want to read you those scriptures now. So this is from Luke 14, 25 to 33. A large crowd was following Jesus. He turned around and said to them, If you want to be my disciple, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else. And let's just pause. 
Jesus was not advocating that we hate people. (laughs) That would not be in his nature. He's using some shock value language to say, I want to be the number one priority. Like, I need to be the number one priority of your life. Your father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. And if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. But don't begin until you count the cost. And then he talks about two parables. The first one he says, For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there is enough money to finish it? Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of money, and then everyone would laugh at you. They would say, there's the person who started that building and couldn't afford to finish it. And here's the second parable. Or what king would go to war against another king without first sitting down with his counselors to discuss whether his army of 10,000 could defeat the 20,000 soldiers marching against him? And if he can't, he will send a delegation to discuss terms of peace while the enemy is still far away. So, you cannot become my disciple without giving up everything you own. Boom. (laughs) Salvation's completely free, right? When we get saved, it costs us nothing. But when it comes to being his disciple, it costs us everything. And this is what we're going to unpack today. He wants to be number one. And he deserves to be number one. He doesn't want to be a tack on to the end of your life where you go through your week and then it gets to Sunday and you come to church and you think about him for the couple of hours that you're here and then you go on with life and you don't really think about him. That's not what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. He is calling us to follow him in every area of our life, in every role you have. If you're a wife, If you're a husband, the Lord says, in that relationship, I want you to follow me. In your relationship with your parents, he says, I want you to follow me. In who you are in your workplace, I want you to follow me. In who you are when you meet a stranger, I want you to follow me. In who you are in a church community, I want you to follow me. In who you are when nobody's around, he says, I want you to follow me. And when Jesus was here on earth, You know, when he was calling his disciples to some of them, all he said was, follow me. And they went, okay. (laughs) And they dropped what they were doing, and they followed him. And he's physically in heaven right now. And we have his word, right? We have the scriptures that we can learn his teachings and learn how to live from his scriptures. And we need to know what he said in the scriptures, right? We need to learn how to live from what he taught. But it gets even better than that, because he said, if I go better for you because I'll send another. He said this. He said in John 14, 16 to 17, and I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that you may abide with, that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you, the Holy Spirit. So even though Jesus physically isn't here, the Holy Spirit is here. And that word another in that scripture is the Greek word alos or allos. I don't know how to, I don't speak Greek. (laughs) Something like that, allos, allos. And that word means another of exactly the same kind. The Holy Spirit is here and he says, follow me. He's with you and in you everywhere you go in your life. And he says, Follow me. And he will never go against what the scriptures say ever. But it's the best adventure ever (laughs) to follow him and to be led by the Holy Spirit in your life. It is the best adventure. Okay. Another of the very same kind. I love that. So I wasn't sure if I was going to tell a story, but I will. I have a friend. She does not belong to this church. You do not know her. And she's been a Christian a really long time, similar to me. Um, We've been friends for a long time. And she's been really unhappy in her marriage for a while. And over the last couple of years, she has enjoyed the attention of other men to the point where she's had some physical intimacy with men who are not her husband. And I've had multiple conversations with her about this, but I had one recently, and I said to her, if your husband knew what you had been doing, what do you think he would say? And she very sadly said, 
I don't think he'd even care. Because we're so drifted so far apart, I don't think he'd even care. And then I said to her, what do you think Jesus thinks about your behavior? And she said something really interesting. She said, I know he's with me, and I know his blood covers all my sin, so I don't think it matters. Mmm, boom. And I have followed the Lord for a long time now, and I would say, how you live does matter. It matters. He's called us to be set apart and holy, and we will make mistakes. But that's when repentance comes in and we turn and we stop. We don't get it right. We're not perfect. But her response kind of said to me, I don't really care what Jesus thinks. Like, he sorted it all out on the cross. And there's truth to what she said because, yes, the Lord is with her in her sin. He is with us when we sin. He does not walk away when we sin. Otherwise, we'd all be stuffed. (laughs) And it's true that his blood, what he did on the cross, covered her sin. That sin was not unforgivable. It's totally forgivable. All our sin is covered by the cross and what Jesus did. Yesterday, today, and forever, everything that we do wrong is covered. But when you follow him, you have to care what he thinks. (laughs) This life is for an audience of one. It's for him. In contrast, I heard an interview with a preacher from America named John Bevere. And he was talking about his struggle with pornography when he was younger, that he an addiction he couldn't get free from. And he said it wasn't until he had a revelation that he was hurting the heart of God that he turned and that addiction was done because he put Jesus first. He goes, this hurts the heart of God. My sin hurts the heart of God. That's it. It's done. It's over because he's the one that matters the most. You know what? And that's what he deserves. He deserves our everything. Um, This year, I've challenged myself to read some of the books of the Old Testament that I've just never been able to quite get through because I don't get them and they're kind of boring. But I'm like, okay, I need to have read the whole Bible. Like, come on, Sarah. (laughs) It's time. So I'm reading Numbers at the moment. And (laughs) sorry, I was doing Leviticus just before that. Oh, my gosh. Anyway, I'm doing it. It's good. I'm looking for who God is in the scriptures. And... I've been so struck, (laughs) everyone's laughing, I've been so struck with the way the Lord wanted to be with his people back before Jesus died on the cross, right? He wanted to be with his people, he made a way, right, through lots of different types of offerings and sacrifices, but he wanted to be with his people. And every time his people, the Israelites, were now between Egypt and the Promised Lands, they're in the wilderness, and he would give them such great provision direction. He would give them laws to obey so they could have him in their midst. And constantly they would go, oh, I don't really trust God. Like that, they just, no, nah, that's not the right, we're not going to do that. And they'd whinge and they'd complain and they'd go and make golden calves and worship that instead. And, and every time they didn't trust the Lord and they didn't obey him, you read his response. He was hurt. Like, He was, like, crushed and angry. And you know what? It's different now that Jesus has come and died. But he's the same God. Same yesterday, today, and forever. And when we don't trust him, and we don't put him first, and we grumble and whinge about what's happening in our life, and we don't believe the things he said, like, that hurts him. Like, he wants to be number one, and he deserves to be number one. And he wants all of you. (laughs) He doesn't want a little portion of your life. He wants all of you. And that is exactly what he deserves. Amen? So let's count the cost. Let me do another scripture about being a disciple. From Mark 8, 34 to 36. Then calling the crowd to join his disciples, he said, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world, but you lose your own soul? So let's count the cost. He says we have to give up our life. So what are we actually giving up? Because the Lord has made us to be worshippers. He's made us to be followers of him. But if we don't worship him and follow him, 
we will worship and follow something else, the ways of this world, our own sinful nature. And if you look around at the world, to me, there's not a lot that looks inviting. <laughs> um, I look at the way people live, and there might be fleeting times of pleasure and joy, but people seem to me to be really broken. So what are we giving up, really? Um, there's a scripture in Timothy that talks about what the world will be like in the end times, and I'm going to read it to you because I think a lot of what we see now in what the world is like kind of lines up with this scripture. So 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 4. You should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there'll be very difficult times, for people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents, and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They'll be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They'll be cruel and hate what is good. They'll betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. This type of people loving themselves and their money and not really caring about anybody else, not really caring about anything that's sacred. It's not exactly all the time what we see, but there are elements of that that I can see in our culture. And I tell you what, it doesn't look inviting. <laughs> if this is what I'm giving up, okay, I feel like that's a pretty good thing to not, to not end up like this by following my own selfish, sinful nature and following the ways of the world. So what am I giving up? Loving only myself, loving money, my pride, being irreverent, not caring about other people, treating people however I want, fleeting pleasure. Those things lead to emptiness, lack, brokenness, broken relationships, pain, suffering. Um, I read some stats that says that every day, here in the lucky country of Australia, nine Australians commit suicide every day. And in 2023, if you're an Aussie, you are more likely to die by suicide than in a car accident. Whoa, boom. Here in the lucky country, and people are miserable. Because when you follow the ways of the world, it doesn't lead to anything good. When you follow your own sinful nature, it doesn't lead to anything good. So Jesus said, if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for him and his gospel, you will save it. So what do you get <laughs> if you give up following the world, following your selfish nature? What do you get? You get him. <laughs> you get the Lord Jesus. You get someone who loves you more than anybody could ever love you. Somebody who cares about you more than anybody will ever care about you. Someone who has an amazing plan for your life, a plan to give you hope and a future. You get him. And not only do you get him, you get the fruits of the Holy Spirit. You get real love, real joy, real peace. You get real hope, real purpose. You get abundant life. Church, I'm counting the cost. <laughs> Giving up my own way and getting him <laughs> and getting all of the goodness that comes from following him. Guys, it's worth it. <laughs> Being his disciple, it is worth it. So who are you following? Can I get the band to come back up? If you're in a place in your life right now where you kind of have one foot in the world and one foot following Jesus, you follow Jesus in some parts of your life, but there are some bits you're like, Lord, you're not coming into this part of my life. I want to challenge you today. The Lord's saying, I want all of you. I want all of you. I, I deserve to have all of the areas of your life. And maybe you're sitting here today and you feel broken and you feel pain and you feel overwhelmed with what's happening in your life. Do you know what? Even in this time of pain and brokenness and suffering, do you know what Jesus said his mission statement was? That he would come to bind up the brokenhearted, to set the captives free. He wants you to follow him in this brokenness. He wants to counsel you through this brokenness. He wants to walk with you through this brokenness because his plan for you is healing and wholeness in Jesus' name. And maybe you've just 
there's an area of your life that you know the Lord's asking you to increase your follow. <laughs> there's something that he wants you to start doing, and you know the Holy Spirit is tugging on your heartstrings to say, today, it's time to start following me. It's time to start listening to me more. And maybe you're somebody who's never truly committed their lives to Jesus. Maybe you've never really made that decision. And today you can. You can say yes to him, yes to being his disciple, yes to following him, and yes to all of the benefits, all of the amazing things that it takes and that comes your way when you follow the Lord Jesus. So we are going to worship and then I'm going to come back up here and we're going to pray. So let's all stand and we're going to spend some time worshiping the Lord and then we'll pray, okay?
God, we want you to be our Lord and Saviour. Not just our Saviour, but our Lord. We want to follow you, Father. Lord, I pray for everyone in this room. Lord, I pray whatever the next step is for them, Father, that you will draw them to that this morning. Whether it be to make a commitment to you for the first time or to recommit or to commit all of their life to follow you in every area of their life or to go to a new level of following you in in their day-to-day walk. Lord, I pray you'll speak to each person individually right now about what it is that you are calling them to. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, if you want prayer, if you need to make, you know, have some time with the Lord, need someone to pray with you through what you've heard this morning, you've just felt the Holy Spirit tugging on your heart, then please come forward and get some prayer. Our God is good, amen. He is good and he's got good plans for us and he wants all of us. So be blessed. Go and have some time fellowshipping, having some coffee. If you want prayer, please come forward and get prayer this morning. Amen.